get your Bibles, please, and we'll go to the sixth chapter of Matthew, and I'm excited about the lesson tonight. We'll let everybody get in their place, Matthew 6, and in just a moment, we'll begin to teach from that chapter. This is a continuation, if you will, lesson number two on the subject, eternity. We're talking around the subject of eternity. I've called it the eternity series. That means it's going to last for an eternity. I'm kidding. Praise the Lord. And I, I'm looking forward to uh, this lesson. This will be a, a one point tonight, really. And then next week, I'm going to get into a broader subject under the topic of eternity. And here's, here's what I'm going to deal with next week. I hope you think about it. Maybe think toward yourself about this subject. We're going to talk about worrying in light of eternity worrying. Does anybody here admit, say, I do worry from time to time? We're going to look at worry in light of eternity. And that puts us in perspective. We're going to deal with that next week. But getting to where we were last week, let me give you a little background. You're in Matthew 6. We'll read there in a moment. Last week, we started in Matthew 25. And I, I thought I knew where I was going with that lesson. And then I'll, I'll tell you what, what checked me, what, what kind of made me pivot a little bit, was I desperately, and I mean this with the sin, most sincere uh, heart possible, I desperately want our young people that are with us in service to really understand this subject of eternity. And I'm not going to follow it along a theological line that otherwise I feel impressed to do or inclined to do. I'm rather going to try to follow a, 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 the line that Jesus used. And by the way, it's always good to do that. And, and really learn from the words of Jesus of what or how we ought to think in relation to eternity. So, so all doctrine is about Jesus. But, but, but honestly, some doctrines, you could, you could follow a theological course on this and that's great, and, and I would rather do that because it, it more appeals to my kind of thinking or my way of thinking. But I got to thinking about how would a young person best understand eternity? And Jesus was such a simple, straightforward teacher. Furthermore, Jesus knows a little bit about eternity. And so we're going to study that. But before I get to that, let me do a review from the 25th chapter. You don't have to go there. And I'll pray in just a moment. Last week, we talked about, out of Matthew 25, several thoughts around the subject of eternity. The first one I gave was this, just reminding you, that God has always wanted his creation with him forever. That's been God's desire. That was his choice. And by God's design, God left that fellowship factor in the hands of of his created beings. And so we know Lucifer and the angels chose not to fellowship with God and they were thrown out of heaven. And we also know our first father and mother chose uh, by disobedience and by doubting God to ruin that fellowship that God had intended forever. So we looked at that for a while and then we looked at uh, oddly enough, a third that made a choice. The first was Lucifer and the devils and, and then Adam and Eve. And then last week, at, for whatever reason the Lord led me to deal with this, we looked at Judas' choice. And we talked about Judas Iscariot and how he, against all of the investment in his life, if you recall, we talked about his right association, his right education, his right reputation, his right participation. He had everything possible to help him make a correct and righteous choice, but he chose not to be with Jesus. And he betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. How many still think that is baffling? It literally baffles me, and it brings me right back to the Millennial Kingdom example that we talked about three or four weeks ago, how Jesus on the earth during the thousand-year reign, Jesus is here in, in Jerusalem. There's no sin on the earth. 
the, uh, Satan and the devils are bound. The only sin is within the, the beings of those who are born in the thousand year. They have a nature to sin. So there's no profanity allowed. There's no graffiti on the buildings. This is the millennial kingdom where all nations come to Jerusalem to worship God. It's a perfect environment exactly like Adam and Eve had. And at the end of the thousand years, what happens is Satan uses his number one tool. What is his number one tool? Deception. And he deceives the nations. You can see it in Revelation 20, verse 7. He deceives the nations into disobedience. And certainly we know they did not win. And so we, we looked at that last week. So admittedly, I'm going to have a change in direction. And, I, and I'm aware of the fact, again, I'm saying this for the benefit of the parents, that I'm not a novice or a newbie in this thing of pastoring. I, I know if I don't give these young people... Uh, 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 an entrance level on what I'm preaching about. I never want young people to come to church and go, I have no idea what he's talking about. I can't understand that. He's using words I cannot understand. Uh, and I'm not playing down to ignorance of children, but they're inexperienced, and I want them to enjoy coming to midweek Bible study. Amen. And so uh, that's, that's my earnest appeal. As well, I want church members to come to Bible study. Amen. I really, really do. Uh, we... we uh, uh, so so that's, uh, that's what I'm after tonight with the Lord's help. So I want to go to Matthew 6 now. And uh, we're going to move from last week's big point was it's about a choice. It's about a choice. Tonight, I want to bring number two, and it's going to be our concept of eternity. So I'm going to spend the next couple of weeks talking around this topic, the concept you have, or our concept of eternity eternity. Before we read the text, let's pray. Now, Father, thank you that you give us this time together. Help me to be careful and concise and very uh, deliberate in what I say. May you use it, Father, now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew 6, and we're going to read verses 24 down through verse 34. So everybody there in the Bibles? And let's look together. You follow along as I read. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the, to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What shall you eat or what shall you drink? Nor yet for your body, what shall you put, up, put on? Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? And which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto uh, his stature. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. This is all red letter, isn't it, church? This is Jesus speaking. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Let's read verse 33 out loud together. Ready? Begin. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Several years ago, boys and girls, I read the story about an eight-year-old boy who had eye surgery. And in 1910, this is when this happened, this eight-year-old boy, born blind, he'd never seen, never saw light, never saw images. It was complete black. By the way, if you close your eyes as tight as you can, you still see light. Imagine having no visual perception whatsoever. In 1910, one of the first of the 20th century cataract surgeries was performed in Europe. And this little boy, uh, was uh, the cataracts were removed, very, very uh, primitive equipment, 1910. By the way, there were cataract surgeries being done clear back into the 1600s, but they butchered the eyes. But this little boy's bandages were on. They took the bandages off. And again, this eight-year-old boy, never seen before in his whole life, they pulled the bandages off and they said, do you see? 
And the boy opened his eyes and he said, I can see. And they put a hand up in front of him. And they said, what do you see? And he paused and he said, I don't know. Does that sound strange to you? He'd never seen a hand in his life. And then they did this. They said, what do you see now? He said, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's moving. He'd never seen it before. There's something to be thought about that. When you think about this little boy, he had the vision of light, but he had no perception of what he was seeing. The word perception is an important word. I want you to catch this definition. Perception is one's way of regarding, here's another word, one's way of interpreting. When we talk about eternity, you and I are just like that little boy. We cannot comprehend eternity. So Jesus takes great pains in Matthew 6 to do this. And to teach us what this is. And not just the splendors of eternity. And last week, if I remember right, I told you the 21st and 22nd chapter of Revelation are all about the details of heaven and the new city of Jerusalem and the, the gates of Pearl and all that stuff. I don't know what all that means. To me, that's all this. Because I can't imagine gold that's transparent. So here's the word again, perception. This illustration I gave of that little boy reaches every one of us if you just stop and think about it. Because we sit week after week, we sit and listen to preaching and teaching that may or may not fall within our perception. And I'm acutely aware of this as a pastor and as a preacher. You see, it's one thing for me to spend anywhere from six to eight hours on a sermon, and I get this meat into my spirit, into my mind. I do the word searches. I do the, uh, the, 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 the language studies. I do all the grammatical uh, uh, structuring, and, and I do all the background and, the, and, the, and, the, and all of the, uh, the cultural application. But, but you come in here, and somehow the Holy Spirit has got to give you perception. Otherwise, most people are coming into church and you kids are no different. What, what, what are you looking at? I don't know what it is. Jesus was so good at provoking us to perception. As a matter of fact, I read on with this uh, story of this little boy. There was a book written uh, by a man by the name of Arthur Zayance, Z-A-Y-E-N-C-E. And he's a professor at Amherst College in North, uh, ha North Hadley, Massachusetts. And he uh, wrote a book that's titled Catching the Light. It's a very, don't buy it, don't read it. I'm not reading it either. But he did make a commentary on this amazing discovery about this little boy. And here's the discovery. That really the miracle of that cataract surgery was not removing the cataracts. It's really a work of education. Because now he can diffuse light in his mind. He sees the difference between shades and motion, but he has no idea what he's looking at. So it really comes down to an education thing. This is how I feel about eternity. Eternity's great. I'm looking forward. I'm going to heaven. Can't wait. Going to see Jesus. That's great. What does that mean? <laughs> God is so good to help us, isn't he, church? You see, what, what uh, the eye can see is one thing, but what the mind perceives is another. Here's what Zayance said about that, that uh, discovery, about that little boy. Quote, if earlier opportunities for sight are lost, it will be very frustrating and almost impossible to catch up. The surgery in 1910 a person born blind, then given light function, may not be able to see and understand what he's looking at unless educated. One of the surgeons that did that surgery in 1910 is by the name of Lipine. He said this, to give back sight to a blind person is more the work of an educator than that of a surgeon. <laughs> Zayance added, 
the sober truth remains, vision, hear this now, here's a statement, vision requires far more than a functioning physical organ. Without formative visual imagination, we are all blind. Mm. And that's why Jesus gives us details about eternity. Otherwise, we're all blind. Because all we're used to is the terrestrial. All we're used to is a human, and I'm using big words when I say terrestrial, I'm talking about this here. And there's a song I love, just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God's, of breathing new air and finding it celestial. Breathing air in heaven? Again, all we're doing is doing this. Is everybody hearing me? That's all we're doing. So we're going to go. We're going to go to the Bible and learn what Jesus says about eternity. And that's a wonderful thing. Let me just make a couple more comments before we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you want to find that, 2 Corinthians 4. This scientific and factual illustration that I gave you a moment ago about sight, the perception of sight. Can you see the spiritual application there? I know I've alluded to it a couple times, but just imagine or just consider with me spiritual sight. There must be more than just mere spiritual eyes, but there must be an added thing taking place in your heart and in my heart, we'll keep listening to me. And I'm not talking about just perception. Here's the doctrinal word. I'm talking about Holy Spirit illumination. Because if anybody's going to tell us what this is, spiritually now. Now listen, I'm moving from the physical now to the spiritual. If I'm going to understand what that Bible is talking about, if I'm gonna, going to understand what, what this thing, this spiritual truth is all about, the Holy Spirit has got to illumine my spiritual heart to give me the perspective that I need. It comes from the Lord. Are you in 2 Corinthians chapter 4? Let's, let's look at verses 16 through 18, and I'll, I'll read those, and you just follow along there. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish. Now, right now, everybody point to the outward man. It's perishing. So the word perish means to pass. It means to die. So the outward man perish, yet the inward man. How do you point to the inward man? That's the spirit man is renewed day by day. For, now when you see the word for, that's a conjunction. It could be because. So for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, how long is it? So our light affliction, what is our light affliction? That's what we deal with in this outward man. We deal with sickness, we deal with pain. Raise your hand if you deal with disappointments. Raise your hand if you deal with uh, 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 heartache. And I'm thinking of young people too. Raise your hand if you're a young person and sometimes you deal with worry. I know as a kid I did. and Our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So when it talks about weight of glory, it's not talking about weight of glory. It's talking about the loading up of. In other words, the afflictions we carry are light compared to the eternal loaded up blessings in the other place we're going to. So, how many here have some blessings in this outward man? Raise your hand. Do you have some? All right, let me see on your fingers at least how many do you have. I've got 10 fingers, so I've got at least 10. All oh, these are blessings. Here, here's some of them. You ready for this? Taste, sight, hearing, feeling, smelling. Huh? And, and boy, we could go on with blessings there. But the eternal weight 
And how long does that wait? Eternal. Mm, that's something. It, it, so while we look not, but he goes on, he put, he's putting us in perspective. While we look not at the things which are seen. Why is that? Because they're but for a moment. How long are they? What's that? Okay, look at me. What have you been looking at? What's your focus been? Let's admit it. Most of us are on this focus. The, the little light affliction of life. Not the great big weight of glory. Which is but for a moment. Uh, um, where, where's that at there? 17, for our life flexible for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding way to glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Let me ask you a question. How in the world do you look at stuff you can't see? What you talking about, Willis? For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are how long? And so God says this, the spirit man is supposed to be doing this. We can't figure it out. We can't make heads or tails out of it. That boy said, he just said, I see something. <laughs> he didn't know what it was. Somebody could have said, what do you mean? It's a hand. I didn't know that. And so we're going to look now at what Jesus tells us about the spiritual sight. Now, how is your spiritual sight? Let me give you an example, illustration. Look on the screens if you guys can pull that up. I always love these things. They, they challenge my mind. Now, what do you see there? Okay, you're, you're smart. That's right, it's Jesus. But look at how it's obscured. It's a little bit difficult to see. Well, because the physical impedes our ability to see the spiritual. Just allow your mind to drift as you look at that. Look at how it confuses. Just let your mind do it. See, because you hollered it out, Jesus, you zoned right in there. And that's the best one I could find that was a mind game, optical illusion type. Uh, but but uh, what, we, what we have here is an optical trick. So what you see, it isn't, listen, not what you see, but how you view it. We're talking about eternity now. How do you look at life? How do you look at the world around you? Your place now and your place after how do we fulfill Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 where it says, set your affection on things where? Above. How in the world do we do that? How do we do that? Uh, how does an 8-year-old, how does a 16-year-old or a 36-year-old or whatever age you are develop a vision for the eternal? For with that comes our direction. When we get a vision for the eternal, when we get a vision for what we don't understand, what we cannot see, that determines our direction as Christians. See, because if we have a church full of people that can't see one thing eternal, what are we going to do? We're going to live for the nasty now and now. This is why Joel Osteen has done, in many cases, irreparable damage to Christians worldwide because of his dogged philosophy, live your best life now. He's a heretic. I'm not mad at him. He could, he could buy me a thousand times over. <laughs> but his, his concept of live your best life now is in Error to the scripture's mandate. And so let's go to see what Jesus said. After all, he is eternal, amen? amen? He came from eternity past and eternity beyond. And, and uh, I believe what he teaches us here in Matthew 6 can be helpful in 2023. Go back there, if you would, please, Matthew 6. We've already read the scriptures. And we have here, right off the start, a couple of things that I just want to point out. Now, what I'm going to do for the next five minutes or so is I'm going to establish a context of Matthew 6. Now, what I mean by that, uh, uh, folks, context, is every verse fits within a framework of thinking. 
it's rare that we can take a verse and pull it out in its stand alone. There are a few verses that do. But usually when you have a verse, the supporting text around it gives credence, strength, authority, and permanence to the teaching of the verse. All right, Matthew 6.33 is the most familiar here that we read. We all understand that. But can you see from the prior verses that we read how Matthew 6.33 just sets up the format for everything Jesus is teaching in that chapter? It's astounding. It really is. So we, just to, to, to build on that now, in verses 19 and 20, we have a couple of things laid out almost instantly. Uh, verse 19 and 20, he talks about treasures. You see that there? Yeah. Treasures. And then, uh, uh, and notice down to verse, uh, verse uh, number 24, he talks about masters. So we have treasures in verses 19 and 20. Actually, 19 through 23, he talks about treasures. Now again, this is, where, where are our human treasures at? Right here. Treasures. So he talks about treasures, then he talks about masters. Uh, he's talking about treasures and masters, and, and he's, he's, he's showing us that we all have one of two treasures or one of two masters. No man can have two masters, and you can't invest in two specific treasures. It's either here or there or there or here. And so he's drawing that comparative contrast. And then Verses, uh, uh, just backing up even more into the text uh, for context, verses 16 through 18. I won't go there to teach it, but if you read verses 16 through 18, Jesus is dealing with uh, ritualistic worship. He's talking about the Pharisees and how they fast and openly fast. And as they're fasting, they're doing this, oh, oh, and they're, they're showing a ritual worship. And in verses 16 through 18, Jesus is talking about what real worship is. By the way, we don't have ritualistic worship in our churches today too much. There's some, uh, some churches you would think, uh, Orthodox churches maybe, meaning I'm talking about Catholic and uh, high uh, Presbyterian churches and Lutheran churches. As a matter of fact, even some old line uh, Southern Baptist churches have developed a liturgy and all kinds of ritualistic worship. Listen to me, God is not interested in ritualistic worship. God wants worship in spirit and in truth. And, and so Jesus makes a big deal about that. And, and, but you know what we're dealing with today is not so much ritualistic worship. You know what we're dealing with is recreational worship. I've been in youth conferences where, where the preachers are all about, we're going to have fun. Now I'm for having fun. But when it comes to worship, I just don't see the adjective fun too often implied. You say, well, pastor, I want to have a fun church. I want to have a fun worship. Okay, then it's all about you. And Jesus is drawing this uh, very strong condemnation of that ritualistic worship. I threw the recreational worship thing in there because it's kind of a problem today. Can I hear an amen? I mean, after all, if it's not full of emotion, it's not real for me. Listen to me. You can cry tears all you want. It's not going to change your heart. And you can shout at the top of your lungs and swing from the lights and, and have the greatest music on earth. And I'm for all of that. And I'm for having fun serving the Lord. But it's not going to get you right with God. You get right with God here as we repent of sin and we have a heart of worship. Did anybody learn anything there? It's, it's so, so clear. Verses 19 through 23, listen, Matthew 6, 19 through 23, flow to verse, what's after 23? 24. Verses 25 through 34, flow back to verse, what's before 25? 24. 24 is the key verse in this chapter. 33 is a result of 24. Context, look at verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Can't do it. And so Jesus identifies an easy test for every one of us to see if we have a single heart 
or a divided heart when it comes to our focus as Christians. No man can serve two masters. So moving along here, Jesus is drawing this, this, this focus on us about eternity. He's trying to get us to see now. And he's telling us that the battle that you're dealing with in, two, in the year of Christ and even today has to do with wealth and worry. If you read this chapter, keep those two things in mind, you'll see it. And it has a combination with your treasure and trust. And it all has to do with your inner heart. So this passage identifies uh, uh, the purpose of life. It is not to accumulate wealth, but it's to get the approval of God. How many want the approval of God? Say amen. So, so we finally come to a biblical context of this passage, and we ask ourselves this question, what does it mean for me? Once we've established the teaching and, and the context, we must ask the question, what is God's purpose for me? Where do I fit? What do I, where do I belong? What is my perspective, my, my, my description of life in regards to heaven's perspective? This affects our understanding, our purpose. We ask ourselves, why in the world am I here? If Jesus saved me, why not just take me to heaven? If I was saved to go to heaven, why am I still here? Why have I been left here? That's a good question to ask yourself every day. What is my purpose here? Yeah. Gentlemen, your purpose isn't to just make money. If that's the case, steal it. <laughs> this is not your purpose. And your purpose isn't to have fun. Your purpose, man, I have a long list here, what isn't our purpose. And I'm going to shock you with something. Your purpose isn't soul winning. Your purpose isn't a good testimony. Your purpose isn't help others. What is the chief purpose of every one of us? In other words, as, as a man right here, six foot tall, 178 pounds, what's my purpose? I'll tell you what my purpose is, to glorify God with everything about me. Amen. Whatever my purpose is, to glorify God. Now, don't miss me. If I'm glorifying God, how many think I'm going to be a soul winner? If I'm glorifying God, how many think I'm going to have a good testimony? And by the way, you can be a soul winner and have a terrible testimony. You really can. You can put on a good show. I'm not trying to discourage soul winning. The Lord knows we need more of that. But I'm trying to show you that glorifying God is our purpose. By the way, that even answers this thing of Christian liberty. You know, if it's not in the Bible, it doesn't say it's wrong, I'm going to do it. That's not Christian liberty. That's foolishness. If I do anything that would offend a brother or cause a person to stumble, I'm not glorifying God. Well, it doesn't say in the Bible I can't do that, so I can do what I want, and I ought to do whatever makes me happy. Again, it's not about you being happy. What did Jesus pray in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 uh, uh, when he said, uh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the purpose of a Christian, to fulfill the will of God. And so, so... Uh, uh, let, me, let me just give you, I'm going to give you through this study now, I'm going to build uh, around four concepts about how to get a view of eternity. Four concepts from this text. I'll give you concept number one tonight. Can you take it? Say amen. amen. Now here it is. Let me give it to you and I'm going to explain it. We're talking about your treasure. Remember verse 20, 24, no man can have two masters. You're going to hate one or despise the other. So your treasure and your master, it's together there, what you live for. So here's the point, concept number one. What you, what you treasure is determined by your perspective of the value of life. I'm not talking about the life meaning, you know, abortion. I'm talking about the value you hold of life. I'll say it again. What you treasure is determined by your perspective of the value of life. Clearly identified we're going to battle in this life, verses 19 through 21. We won't read that again. But you know what we're battling, really? Stockpiling. We're stockpiling. Notice the word treasure is used there in verse 19, 20, and 21. You see treasure used again and again? The word treasure here can be either a noun or a verb. A treasure is what you have, or a treasure can be what you want. So it goes either way. And I think it's used in these three verses both ways. So I'm going to make a statement. It sounds a little bit confusing, so I'll say it twice. And I'll say it slow for you homeschoolers. Your treasure 
is what you treasure. Your treasure is what you treasure. So treasures on earth or treasures in heaven? Treasures on earth or treasures on heaven? What's that referring to? Location. So can we have treasures on earth? Yes or no? Is it good or bad to have treasures on earth? It depends if that's what you treasure. It's okay to have stuff. By the way, if you're tired of some of your guns, come see me, I'll help you. Right, Nelson? It's okay to have stuff as long as you don't treasure it. I was telling Brother Mikhail, I felt crazy after I said all that to you out there at your truck. We were, uh, you and me and somebody else, we were standing there and I said, I said to Michael, I said, let me tell you right now. I said, when I'm dead, I'm not leaving those kids any money. I'm leaving them sermons, books, my cufflinks, maybe a couple guns, but that's it. I'm giving all my money to missions. Oh, Greg, be quiet. <laughs> Mikhail standing batting his eyes at me. I said, this thing, uh, leaving all this money to the kids. You know, I've been pastoring a long time. And I want to tell you something, I see people fighting over stuff. It's insanity. So my best advice to you is help pay for that church van for the kids. Uh, help send some more missionaries. Just unload it now and leave your kids happy notes. Amen. Smiley faces. <laughs> Clearly, we have a problem with stockpiling. And Jesus talked about that. So treasures on earth, i got to stop with this. <sighs> treasures on earth, that's talking about location. Not only are there different locations, but there's also different substances. What do you mean by that? I mean there's material and there's spiritual. Everybody hear that? Yeah. So there's different location. There's different substance. There's also different duration. How long are things down here? What's the word the Bible used? Temporary or temporal. How long is things up there? Eternal. So... What have you been focused on? You know that. Because we live down here. Pastor, don't be so hard on us, man. We got flesh on. We got to live in this world. And Joe Biden and Joe Biden and Joe Biden and Joe Biden. I know. Jesus' instruction, or we'll call it his eternal concept, is this. Do not, and I'm closing with this, do not unite your heart with this but that. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, thank you that I have the privilege of standing here with this book and with the call of God on my life to preach and teach it. But Lord, the real chore is to live it. And I pray that our hearts will be strangely drawn to that eternal, I'm praying even for the six-year-olds, that God will think about heaven and we'll have our minds on that which is eternal. We can't really understand what we're looking at. Our Human, human minds cannot fully comprehend eternity, but God, I pray that you would illumine us. Put the light on us. Put, turn the light on in our hearts, our inner man, that, Lord, we will seek those things which are above. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, please. The earth competes with heaven. The temporal competes with the eternal. There's a tug of war all the time. So my challenge is this. Start coming if God has spoken to your heart. My challenge is this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It works. It's amazing how your life fills the gaps and the breaks and the cracks and the divots when you have your mind on the right focus. Our Father, we thank you for your precious word and thank you that, God, we, we have the joy of uh, being illumined. God, I pray that you'll continue this work in the days ahead. And, Lord, please draw our lives to that which is eternal. We'll ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.